Hi guys, so we are back. Uh, this is the second portion of the video system. And uh, by doing this one, we will finish the sensory nervous system. Kind of quick, right? Uh, sensory nervous system is actually pretty big, uh, but we just use this as kind of like uh, the, the, in a way it's one of the most complicated one and uh, give you guys an idea that how neural circuits is organized to conduct these sensory, this amazing sensory system. And uh, I, to me, this, this is very essential about the quality of life. Um, yeah, so to enjoy life basically is is basically through this sensory system. If we have time, we can talk more about that. But just be appreciating that. Just be uh, feel appreciation that that you can feel, you can see, you can smell, you can listen. That that's wonderful. That's the beauty of life, of being alive. Right. All right. So so. Very quickly, that this is the slide you probably see right now, all right. And uh, uh, very quickly, that this is what we have left. We 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 left last time that was in the retina. We learned about this circuit that's in the retina, and uh, uh, the major circuit is from the uh, photoreceptor photoreceptor to the bipolar to the ganglion cell. Then this ganglion cell send exon through the optic nerve. So right here. So this is the eye. This is where we have this retina ganglion cells. And uh, they form this optic nerve. So this is bundle of the axon of the retinal ganglia cells. They project through into the brain through chiasm. 60% of the fiber project into the opposite side, 40% project into the epilateral side. The number three doesn't matter. You kind of you can say that about health, health, right? Health coming there, health coming here. Uh, and then and then that and then, and then uh, through the chiasm, that's the same axon. Uh, I want to get your attention is that where they terminated this nerve, this RGC nerve is pretty long. This is the retinal ganglia cell axon. It's pretty long. Same axon, optic nerve, optic tract. The same axon, but before chiasm, it's called the optic nerve. After chiasm, it's called the optic tract. I want to get your attention on the where they terminated. Uh, they can terminate in this region. This is the hypothalamic regular uh, regulation of the circadian rhythm. This region is called supra. Oh, let me let me get this one here so I can just directly copy and paste on it. Supra right here. Let me see. Here we have the fractal nucleus. We have that one there, but we don't have this supra chiasmatic, supra chiasmatic nucleus right here. So that's right here. That is right here. Okay, so that is this nucleus. So that's this one here. All right, that basically is this one. We'll put it here, right? All right. So that's this one. This is a supra chiasmatic, this is chiasm, so it's wrong chiasm, supra chiasmatic nucleus. This one is the one to regulate our circadian rhythm. 
and then it also terminated here in pretectum. This is another neuron. This group of neurons are responsible for the pupillary light reflexes. Reflex. Then it also, actually, the majority of this RGC exon project to the lateral geniculate nucleus, or short for LGN. And from here, we can see that fiber will project into the stride cortex. This is the primary visual cortex. In addition, we also see that some of these axon project into the superior curriculus. This is the nucleus to control our eye and the head movements. So when we pay attention on one thing, we're not just moving our eye, we move our head too. So this is co or, or, um, controlled by this, this supra, sup, supra, superior, sorry, superior curriculus right here. So from here, you get an idea that the visual circuit, not just for the vision, these visual circuits, these retinal ganglia cell projections, plays many roles. There are so many complicated circuits uh, using this information to conduct a lot of works. Visual to give you the vision to let you see is just one of them. There are so many other things that this circuit is also uh, is also participate. So this is a summary of all these neural circuits in the brain or central neural circuits, visual circuits, uh, participate in different functions. Uh, so here I make a list right here. You can see that the major one is the primary visual pathway. So this pathway provides you the vision. And in addition to that, we also have reflexes without eye movement. So this include the pupillary light reflex. Uh, that's the one we talk about right here. That is the prectum or pretectal pre or pretectal nucleus uh, control the light reflex. We also have these circuits to regulate the circadian rhythmicity, right? In addition to that, we also have reflexes with eye movement. Uh, there's several that's all very interesting. For example, the physiological uh, nystagmus. This is the one that that's, uh, that nystagmus is the uh, is to describe the eye uh, very randomly move, tiny, small, but randomly move, jiggling around, something like that. Uh, there is physiological, the one that we are talking about right now. And there is also a pathological type. And so basically that the jiggling will appear quite uh, abnormal, right? Quite unusual, right? So that's the pathological one. But with this one, this is physiological, meaning that uh, this happens to everybody. So so in the beginning that we, we, in, we, we thought that when the eyes are stationary, that's not moving. Uh, when we staring at an object, and uh, so researchers uh, try to realize to to find out if it's true, and uh, so they do research, right? So one way to do research on that is that uh, they can put a contact lens on the cornea, and so when I move, the cornea will move, and uh, um, and. Uh, uh, and this contact lens, contact lens is uh, specially designed. So they put there and uh, what the results are surprising that um, um, results are surprising that uh, they found that the eyeball actually continues moving when they are seeing, when, when these eyes are seeing and uh, uh, so that's that's what everybody. So when you see an eye which seems like stationary, but a living vision, 
uh, when it's function to see things, it actually very small but con con constantly moving around. Another movement, so this is controlled by the vision, you know, controlled by our, and the, the reflex to control the eye movement. Another one is the uh, saccadic uh, movement. So this one is not a tiny, small, random movement. This one is a bold movement. So when we see things, we can very quickly put our focus on one object to the other, to the other. And, uh, and uh, that's very quick. We can either see this one or the other one. And uh, there is no like, stop or uh, change during this way. So it's a very quick movement that's also controlled by our, our, our vision, our intention to see things. Another reflex circuit to control eye movement is the smooth pursuit, pursuit. Uh, movement, pursue movement. So this is the one that we are able to visualize a moving object and continuously tracing it. So that's um, also controlled by the reflex is that when we have an object located in our uh, point of fixation or fixation point that we are staring at it and uh, we can change our visual field and continuously putting this object of interest in the center of our visual field. So that's something quite interesting. And uh, also another one is the vergence movement. So this one is that both eye, two eyes will be coordinate in a way that these two eyes will put their focus on the, on the same spot. And the same spot will project their uh, center portion into the foveas of each eye. So we can focus on thing and not just control one eye, but coordinately control both eye. So this is the vergence movement. And the last but not least is the vestibular movement. Uh, this is very interesting, especially, uh, uh, for example, that um, uh, try, try this. Say, say that you are staring at the computer, right, the screen, and the try to move your head left or right. And you can, you, can, you can see that your visual field, the field, the, 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 the vision that you are seeing, it's actually not being affected, right? You can see the same field while your head moving left, right, up, down, right? You can maintain that kind of visual field. So, so this is very interesting. One thing about this is that this is also called the vestibular ocular reflex. So one thing about this is that in contrast to all the previous like circuits control different kind of function. Uh, in these circuits, these are all rely on the visual signal, the thing that you see, okay? And, uh, uh, and to conduct that reflex or that circuit or that function. This one, the vestibular movement or vestibular ocular reflexes, reflex is one not dominantly depends on the vision, not depends on the signal that you see. This one instead depends on the vestibular apparatus. That is, you know, in our inner ear, we will talk about this one when we talk about the vestibular apparatus in the inner ear, because this one is important to maintain our body balance. And so that's the one, because the vestibular apparatus in our inner ear uh, uh, detect our body balance. So when our body balance change, it will detect it. So the way it does is that these vestibular apparatus, when our head move to one direction, it will guide the eyeball to move to the opposite direction. So that way our eyeball will move to the opposite direction of the head and we will maintain the same visual field, All right? So, uh, so this is very different from the previous one. Previous one, 
rely on the signal of the vision. This one rely on the signal of the vestibular apparatus. So that's all this. We are not going to talk all these uh, central circuits uh, in this lecture. We will talk about something, uh, we, given the short period of time, we will only talk about these three because these three are commonly mentioned and uh, should, be, should be known by you know, the, uh, everyone that who have ever taken, uh, say, neurophysiology, right? So, so we will talk about these three these three, three area. So before we talk about these three, let's look, let's look again at the retinal ganglia cells. These retinal ganglia cells, majority of them, 99%, are the one can serve the role as, 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 as a cell uh, to, 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 to conduct the vision. So that's the one that receives signal, from the photoreceptor to bipolar to ganglia and transduce that signal to the brain. So 99% of this ganglion cell serve this role. However, there is 1% of these ganglion cells do not need signal from the photoreceptor. Itself, themselves can detect light. So light shines on it. That 1% can transduce that light into the action potential and transduce it into the brain. So that 1% of the retina ganglia cell is the melanopsin containing uh, ganglia cell. So it has its own opsin. It has its own uh, photo uh, transducer to transduce the photon into the electric signal. Melanopsin, right? And these cells, these cells plays the major role to conduct these two function, these two function, pupillary light reflexes and the uh, uh, regulation of circadian rhythm. So these cells, this melanopsin uh, containing ganglion cells is also called photosensitive retina ganglia cells or intrinsically photosensitive retina ganglia cells. The cells uh, is particularly sensitive to the blue light. Uh, wavelength is 480 nanomore. Don't need to memorize this. You can just memorize that it's sensitive to the blue light. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and that affects our circadian rhythm. Uh, this, this nerve, connects to the suprachiasmatic nucleus to regulate our circadian rhythm. This one also connects to the pretectal nuclei to conduct the pupillary light reflexes. So that's this unique cell. So this one is sensitive to just light. They don't, they don't conduct the vision, okay? The, the, any light, a small light, intense light, will trigger it, even though we, they don't project into the visual cortex to cause you to see, but they affect our pupil, they affect our circadian rhythm. That's why that is, is recommended that when you sleep, keep away from the cell phone, right? Because cell phone has this blue light shining on it. And, uh, and even though you don't think you are seeing anything, this blue light actually can affect your circadian rhythm. And the circadian rhythm, we know that it actually can affect our body's hormone secretion, our body's homeostasis, so, and affects your sleep. So that's that. All right, so let's first look at this, uh, this uh, pupillary, uh, pupillary light reflex. So pupillary right, right, right reflex is the one to control our iris. And, uh, and uh, can you control your iris just intentionally? No, right, you cannot because nobody can really control the iris. And that, is, that control of the iris is not intentional, so it's autonomic. And, uh, and so we know that that's why these iris muscles is not 
scared muscle. Scared muscle is part of the voluntary movement, right? So this is the autonomic. So this smooth muscle must be, sorry, this muscle must be smooth muscle. And the nerve must be part of the autonomic nervous system. All right, so this is the uh, probably uh, light reflex is pathway. When you, when you ever you see a reflex pathway, uh, no matter what kind of reflex they are, uh, it is, uh, there are three things you always uh, need to know that no matter how complicated, how complicated or how small it is, three things. One is the input, the other one is the center, and the other one is the output. All right, so the input here is the region. So the inputs go through the optic nerve. Let's, let's just go through these slides very quickly and we can go talk about that pathway. So this is the, uh, the bilateral uh, projection from retina ganglion cells will project into the pretectum. Then it will trigger sensitive light without photoreceptor because this, this is the uh, uh, innervated by this melanopsin retina ganglion cells. It doesn't really rely on the photoreceptor itself can detect light. Now, this will send signal into the Edinger uh, westfall nucleus. This Edinger westfall nucleus is the preganglion of a parasympathetic parasympathetic neuron, uh, and uh, and then it will send signal of the ocular motor, ocular motor nerve. This is cranial nerve three. So the input is through the cranial nerve two, the optic nerve. The center is the pretectin right here, pretectin. And the output is the cranial nerve three, the ocular motor nerve. These ocular ner ner nerves go through the preganglion, the Edinger westfall nucleus, then the post ganglion, which is the ciliary ganglion, then it will innervate to the constrictor muscle in the iris. And that causes the pupil constriction. So that's that. Uh, this one showing you the picture, give you the visual idea about what's going on with this reflex. This is the retina and uh, 1% uh, of it will project to the pretectin right here, pretectin. And uh, you need to know that this pretectin receive bilateral information. So one side project here, the other side also project here. So they receive bilateral. And uh, uh, contraction is also bilateral. So pre right here, ending westfall, post ciliary to the muscle, to the uh, iris muscle causing the, causing the uh, pupil constriction. So that's, that's, uh, that's why that when, when some uh, the physicians can use this uh, skills technique to detect the pupil reflexes and to detect the autonomic nervous system, right? And uh, um, when they do, they, they basically put a little bit of light, fresh light uh, on the eye and see if it causes the pupil reflex, pupil constriction, right? They don't need to put it on both eyes simultaneously. They can just put it on one eye and they would expect if this is everything is healthy, normal, they would expect to see the pupil constriction on both eyes, okay? So that's that. So this uh, on one eye, it will project, it will get project bilateral to the pretectin and the, the contraction is on both eye, okay? So that's that. Here, this one summarized this uh, pupillary life reflex is the input signal is cranial nerve two, the efferent, efferent, efferent is output, the cranial nerve three, and uh, the uh, center is pretectal nucleus in the midbrain. And uh, the, uh, the output is to control the muscle. So this is the autonomic 
And in this case, it's a parent. So autonomic has two branches, right? Has the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. In this case, this is the parasympathetic. So we have the preganglion neuron, which is located in the um, uh, in the uh, 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 I think uh, Westfall nucleus, and also postganglion neuron, which is located in the ciliary ganglia, and uh, the then the cause the uh, iris iris uh, muscle constriction, pupil constriction. So this should be iris. So that's that. All right, so so just uh, very quickly that uh, kind of overview again, our uh, nervous system kind of get us, get everybody on the same page. Uh, uh, I want to use these two slides to give us a little bit background and uh, you know a review and kind of make sure that we all know this as a background knowledge uh, in the nervous system. So overall that if we zoom out and look at the nervous system, the nervous system basically can be uh, divided into two big portion, right? One is the central nervous system, the other one is peripheral nervous system. What what's, what different? What dis distinguish these two? Because everything is connected, right? So what distinguish the central versus peripheral? Basically, uh, some people would say that is the PR meter, or we 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 earlier we talked about it. We it, it could be the dual meter because these two basically connect very ne near to each other, All right? And uh, everything within that dual meter or PR meter is the central nervous system. Everything out of that dual matter is the peripheral, right? And that make the retina ganglia cell and the optic nerve, everything else, everything to, you know, is as the, in that system is the central nervous system. And what's the difference between the central and the peripheral? The major difference is the mari, right? So the central nervous system, the mari is the oligodendrocyte. And that is the mari cell for the optic nerve and up the tract. Uh, in the peripheral, the myelin cells are the strong cells. So that's a major difference. Of course, there are several other differences such as the uh, pre peripheral nerve system uh, are capable to conduct the uh, regeneration. If their axon is trun truncated, uh, we can see this axon can get regenerated, regrow back, but we don't see it in the central nervous system. So that's a, that's a big difference. One of the reason is the mari, because here we use the, the, the oligodendrocytes actually can block the regeneration process. And, uh, and the, in the peripheral, strong cell won't prevent that regeneration. So that's also related to the mari. Now, with the central, central is in the brain, in the, in, within that dual matter, so that's fine. Now, the peripheral. Peripheral is the nerve that innervated or interact with non-neuron. And this non-neuron can be two category. One is that they interact or in, innervate it with the, uh, as, as a receptor to get the signal from either around us in the world or, or uh, information in our body non-neuron, okay? So they gather information. So that's the sensory neuron. And also another branch is that, so this sensory neuron uh, uh, is the one that we are talking right now, uh, that include the dorsal root ganglion. So this is the one that we just finished, right? The one that we talk about the somatic sensory, the sensory neuron enter into the dorsal root ganglion and the project into the somatic sensory cortex. So we, we talk about this one. Today, we talk about this one, the cranial nerve. Here we talk about the cranial nerve too, enter into the brain. So 
just by using these two examples, we, we, we kind of cover this portion. And uh, later we will talk about this motor. Uh, we, we talk about the motor. So in addition to the sen sensory, we also have the peripheral also uh, interacts with non-neuron, which is to send axon to control the muscle. So that's called the motor branch, right? And uh, this motor system include that uh, if the, the muscle, muscle, we know that there are three types of muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiomyocyte, and the smooth muscle. The one we can voluntarily control is this skeletal muscle. So it's right here. So it's the skeletal motor. That's the voluntary control. Another group is non-involuntary. That, that's a motor contraction, muscle contraction, but not controlled by our intention. And so that is the autonomic, autonomic nerve system. And the smooth muscle and the cardiomyocytes are controlled by this autonomic nervous system. And in this autonomic nerve system, we have two branches, sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And these two uh, uh, work on the controlling of these smooth muscle and the cardiomyocytes. So that's, that's, we should know, right? That's this, this, uh, this the system of the, of the central, of the nervous system, right? So that's something we should know. What we, in, 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 in terms of, so this motor system, what, what we really know about this motor system is that uh, we talked about this one already, kind of give you guys another overview on this one. These motor system control the muscle. There are three type muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiomyocyte, and the smooth muscle. So it can be have two branches. It's, it's one is the skeletal muscle control. This is uh, control the skeletal muscle. And the other one is involuntary, that's autonomic. Autonomic has two branches, sympathetic and parasympathetic. What we really need to know here is that these two branches release uh, using different neurotransmitters. The skeletal muscle motor release the acetylcholine to control the skeletal muscle. Uh, sympathetic nerve, in the end, they release the norepinephrine to control the smooth muscle. Parasympathetic nerve release, in the end, they release acetylcholine to control the smooth muscle. So that's something that you need to know that you should be aware of that. And another thing is that the difference between the skeletal muscle control or voluntary motor control versus the autonomic is that in the autonomic, it's not just one nerve from, this, from the spinal cord into the muscle. In the autonomic, it has two nerves. So it has preganglionic and the postganglionic. Preganglionic and the postganglionic uh, nerve. And uh, the neurotransmitter to transmit signal from pre to post is the acetylcholine in, in, in both sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So that's that. All right, so we have that. I want you to have that as a background, so we know that. Now today, we let's go back to the iris. Iris is one that's autonomic. That's not that you can control, right? The pupil constriction is not something that you can intentionally control. So it's the autonomic. A lot of time, this release this uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, typically, that uh, sympathetic is uh, in the body mode that is during the fight or flight. The parasympathetic is during that we are feeding and digesting. So sometimes, in majority, that norepinephrine usually causes vessel constriction. The acetylcholine from the parasympathetic usually causes vessel dilation. That is the typical, but we know that there are some exceptions, right? No epinephrine can cause uh, coronary artery con uh, uh, dilation. And so it's not just constriction. All right. Also there, in terms of exception, that's the exception that we are going to see today. 
even though generally this one caused constriction, this one caused dilation. However, they are exception, right? So one major exception is right here in the pupil. So this is the pupil muscle control and the control by the autonomic nerve system. So it has two branches, sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So this is the autonomic nerve system of the pupillary light reflexes. Muscle control, autonomic, sympathetic versus parasympathetic. All right, so let's take a look at this one here. So from the midbrain, this is pretectal uh, nucleus, nucleus, can control the pupil through the parasympathetic and through the sympathetic. This parasympathetic basically is the one that we just mentioned about. It will cause the preganglionia in the Edinger, Edinger Westfall nucleus to the postganglia, the ciliary ganglion, to control the muscle. So we can know we know that uh, this one will. Give me a second. Okay, maybe this one will work. Okay, so this one will release the acetylcholine from pre, sorry, from the pre to the, oh, hold on a second. From the pre to the pulse right here. So this neuron release acetylcholine and then, the, sorry about that, sorry about that, sorry about that. All right, so that's that one here. And then these parasympathetic may are released as according to X on the muscle. So that's the parasympathetic. As for the sympathetic, the neuron in the end release these norepinephrine to control the muscle. So that's that. All right, so we have it. Uh, but one thing unique is that, so here is the, the pupil again. So this is the pupil. One thing about this pupil is that pupil has two, two types of muscle to control it. One is the circular muscle or sphincter muscle. This muscle is very much like our vascular like vessel smooth muscle when they contract they cause vessel constriction uh, and the, the other is this so this is normal like uh, 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 iris or pupil uh, you have this inner portion of this uh, muscle this is the circular muscle and also you have another group muscle, this is called the uh, dilator muscle. And when, 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 when pupil constrict, these circular muscle contract, causing the pupil become small. And uh, when pupil dilate, it's the other group muscle, that's the radius muscle or dilator muscle to contract to cause the pupil dilate. And, uh, and so in, in our, in our, in our circuits, these two muscles basically innervated by parasympathetic and the sympathetic respectively. So it's right here. Um, so when there is uh, the parasympathetic will cause pupil constriction. Um, and the way it does is that it will release as a calling acting on the M3 receptor to cause vessel to cause the pupil constriction. Sympathetic will cause pupil dilation. And uh, the way it does it is that it will release norepinephrine acts on the alpha-1 receptor to cause pupil dilation. So, so the way to, rem to, to memorize it is, is that uh, it, uh, sympathetic nerve will cause pupil dilation because 
when you are in the situation of the fight or flight, uh, you need to open up your eye, right? You need to get enough light to get into your eye and in order to, 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 to see better, right? So your pupil will dilate. And now we know that this is controlled by the norepinephrine and, uh, and norepinephrine acts on different kind of receptor. In this case, it acts on the alpha one. Alpha one is very common, right? In the uh, uh, blood vessel, we also see norepinephrine acts on the alpha one receptor and it causes uh, pupil dilation. One thing unique is that in the parasympathetic, pupil will constrict, right? Pupil will become smaller. However, this is not due to relaxation. It's also is caused by the parasympathetic, which release acetylcholine where everything is fine. However, this acetylcholine act on the M3 receptor in the circular muscle. And uh, in the end, this one cause muscle constriction, not relaxation. This constriction actually caused the pupil constriction. So that's that. So, the, here we have several quiz questions we can use, right? Like uh, 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 which, uh, which autonomic nerve system participate in the pupil dilation, pupil constriction, was the neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter, that one is easy. Sympathetic release, the norepinephrine, parasympathetic release, as I call it, then uh, the uh, sympathetic acts on what muscle? The radial muscle or dilator muscle, uh, in this case, we call it a uh, uh, dilator muscle, right? To, to cause this pupil dilation. In the parasympathetic, uh, acetylcholine acts on what? Acetylcholine acts on the M3 receptor. M3 is located where? In the sphinc sphincter muscle or the circular muscle to cause pupil constriction. So, so that's how these iris muscles are controlled by the autonomic nerve system. Both sympathetic and the parasympathetic acts on muscle constriction. It just, they act on different muscle to cause different muscle constriction, but both of them cause muscle constriction. So that's uh, very interesting. All right, so now we know everything about this pupillary light reflexes, the input output, and how is this autonomic acts on these two group of muscle to cause dilation and constriction? All right, so pupil, pupillary light reflex is done. Good. Next up is the circadian reason, right? Circadian reason is for a long time. That's, that's even though we are not studying the nerve, right? Even though we, we don't, we are not just general physiology, okay? We should know that our body has the, we talk about this one, right? We talk about this uh, endocrine system. When we talk about the endocrine system, we talk about this one. Our body's hormone vary uh, 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 throughout a day. Uh, the, the, the typical one are these two, cortisol and the melatonin. Cortisol high in the early morning and the gradual decay throughout the day. Melatonin high in the middle of night and uh, uh, decrease uh, when, when we wake up, right? So that's that. And uh, uh, for a long time, people know this and the people are interesting, interested about it and try to understand what control it. If our body hormone release vary throughout the day, circadian reason is circa is uh, 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 during DM is day, right? So during this day, we have this reason. Is this reason controlled by our internal biological clock or is that affects by the environment, by the, the light, right? So, so people study it and people try to understand it. And uh, uh, there was earlier, there was study that they would try to see if this affected by the light, they will put a uh, uh, volunteer, right? And uh, put them into the dark room and uh, put them there without clock, without anything, no light, and uh, put them there for 40 days, for example. 
and the, during that time they will measure their blood and they will measure their uh, evaluate they will also detect their sleeping pattern and the, they found that these people even though without light without clock they will remain maintain their sleeping pattern they will also show the same pattern of their hormone showing this circadian reason so so this is not affected by light this is biological clock so that's very interesting however we also know that uh, when we when we fry it we change different time zone uh, we will eventually adjust adjust to the local time zone so we will also gradually change our circadian reason to match the local time zone right so how is that how is these two put together now we know that we have a biological clock however this biological clock can be regulated by the light and uh, and uh, as you as you and as many of you guys probably travel you know to different regions my personal experience is that uh, when I was young, I can adjust very quick, but I'm getting old. And uh, when I when I when I when I fly back to America, and uh, it will be very difficult for me to adjust. I will I will be very dizzy throughout the day and uh, uh, for a couple of days. And I really I find, of course, people. What you can do is you can take medicine, right? You can take melatonin and help you to sleep. But another way that I don't like to take medicine. Right? But so the, the, the way that I found is the easy way to find, to, to, to conquer it, to adjust this to, you know, during the daytime, I, I walk out, I, I, I was outside and uh, hiking or do everything under the sun throughout a day. And then that very quickly adjusts my circadian reason and I can adjust into the local time zone. So that's that. All right. So this is controlled by light and this light, this light to regulate our circadian reason is through this melatonin uh, 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 retina ganglia cells. So the melanopsin, sorry, melanopsin, melanopsin ganglia cells. So, uh, so this, this retinal ganglia cells detect the light. They will send signal into the supracosmic nucleus. Then that will adjust our master clock and that will adjust our circadian rhythm. So that's that. So what you need to know is that this is the nucleus to control, to regulate our body's circadian rhythm, supracosmic nucleus. And it detect it get a signal from the light by the melanopsin retina ganglia cells. All right, so that's that. Just very quick that the uh, the uh, the very recently not today but recently 2017 Nobel Prize is given to the researchers who identify the molecular basis of this circadian reason. So if you're interested, you can look into this, uh, this presentation. Uh, I find that Nobel Prize uh, presentation is, 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 is uh, very entertaining. It's, uh, it's, you, you will find that it's, it's, it's not that difficult. When you look into it, it's not that difficult. When they present it, they try to present it to the public. And so, so you, you find that it's quite interesting. All right, so that's that. And, uh, um, and so that is those two reflexes. So you know these two, you know these two, you know these two now. Now let's move on to this one, the primary visual pathway. So that's this one, primary visual pathway. So this is a pathway that we gather the information in the retina ganglia cells, then it will, go through the optic nerve, uh, go through the chasm and uh, uh, to the opposite side. And uh, not all of them, about 60% uh, uh, cross 
in the Carson, and after Carson is same axon, but the organ, this portion, this fiber is called the optic tract. Then this optic tract project into the dorsal lateral genic geniculate nu nucleus. Uh, so it's uh, so so in, in of these dharmas. So I would like to tag this as the uh, as the uh, opportunity to introduce you the thermos. I think we talk about similar things in the somatic sensory cortex in the system, but why not we talk about it again? It doesn't hurt, right? So this is the thermos. Thermos is the center in located in very center of the brain. It means that everything go in into the brain will go through the thermos. And the thermos has different lobe and different lobe process the input from different uh, sensory signal. So uh, this is one that we, the one we show in our somatic sensory cortex system is this one. So we know that the one that enter into the ventral, ventral posterior uh, nuclei is the one that's from the somatic sensory signal. So here is the one that from the uh, spinal cord, right? Spine going here and then project into the somatic sensory cortex. And today we learned that not only that, here is the visual signal, visual signal right here from the optic tracks to the lateral genetic curate body, or we call it lateral genetic nucleus right here. So to the lateral genetic curate, nucleus right here, optic tract, optic nerve, optic tract. And here is the occipital lobe sent to the uh, visual cortex. So that's that. This is hub. And uh, the, they will send fiber through this, uh, uh, the internal caps, capsule into the different region of the brain because this is the hub. And uh, when they send to different region of the brain, they will, the fiber will kind of fan out to form this beautiful corona radiata. This is the, uh, the coronal view that you can see that it's kind of fan out like that. Or if, you, if we see it in the uh, sagittal view, you can see it uh, fan out uh, from back. Uh, so this is the uh, corona, uh, corona radi radiata. Corona, radi corona, corona radiata, right? And among, uh, um, among these fibers, a group of fiber is the one from the LGN, lateral genetic nucleus project into the visual cortex. And uh, this portion is called the optic radiations right here. So from the LGN, lateral genetic curate nucleus project into the visual cortex. Visual cortex is also called striate cortex. And this is part of the corona radiata. This portion is called the optic radiation project to that. So that is the pathway. So the primary visual pathway uh, from the lateral genetic nucleus uh, participate this internal capsule, go pass through this optic radiation to the primary visual cortex. It's also called V1, the visual cortex, number one. There are extra striate stri stri cortex that associate visual cortex to process the visual information and that will be V2, V3, V4. And here is the primary one is the V1. This is also according to the uh, Rodman's area 17. And this region is, is around this feature is called the Kelkrain. Kel Karin, Karin Fisher. So let's look at this one here. This is the uh, the brain. When you see a brain, you probably know this already. When you see a brain, they can be presented in different way. But a very typical one is to show you two view. One is the lateral view. 
that's the, the visual cortex. They will also show you the medial view because this medial portion also contains a lot of the cerebral cortex. So you probably don't see a lot in this lateral view, but in the medial view, you see this is the Kerkrans circus or fissure. And along this one, uh, uh, upper and the lower portion, these two, these are the primary visual cortex, the V1. All right, so that's the one to process our vision. Just to give you a comparison that uh, I think we, we showed this one before that the visual cortex overall is pretty big. In human, uh, visual cortex is, uh, is, is probably one of the largest sensory cortex. <clears throat> and it suggests that the, uh, our, our human rely on the visual signal very much. Uh, if we compare to different species, we can see that in the, in the mouse, for example, uh, olfactory cortex would be the very biggest one because they rely on their smell. Okay, human rely on vision, and that's why we pick these two region as the as the the the, 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 the selected two area that to talk about the sensory sig signal sensory process. All right, so we basically know everything now. Know everything from this projection from the retina to the visual cortex, all right? What we need is we need to know that how do they project, all right? So this is related to the visual field. How do they project? If we, this is an old like machine, if you go to the ophthalmology, they probably still use this one. And they can detect your visual field, okay? So you can kind of like a, a block one eye, and only use the other one and stay in the center and don't move. There will be a camera here to check your eye ball to make sure that your eye is not moving around. And when you stare at that, it will be randomly flash light in this field and to see whether you see it or not. So in this region, you will see it very well, but this visual field, is defined, so the, the region you can see is the called visual field. This visual field is defined by the degree because this, this, this pen can be close or far, far away. So this, the size doesn't really count. However, degree would be, would be, would be reliable one, would be a reliable major. And so uh, the way uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the center and the closing to the nose, nasal portion or the temporal portion. Uh, so the light will shine on different of this randomly on different area you can see very well around here, but further away, you will not see it, right? So you will get the idea about this visual field from this simple exam. And so this is typical like a visual field of one eye. And you can see that this portion is black because this is the blind spot, right? Do you guys remember what's the blind spot? This is the optic nerve location because optic nerve head doesn't have the photoreceptor. If you forgot to go back to the uh, the previous lecture, we talked about retina, you will, you, will, you will see that. Right, so this is the location of the of the optic nerve head, and it doesn't have the photoreceptor, so it's it, 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 it's a blind spot. And so, if the light shine on this one, you won't see it. And this is the macula, right? Macula area. And so you see this, 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 and uh, and uh, and so this is your visual field. This all visual field will project into your retina and all the way into the visual cortex. So it's all the way into this visual cortex, this V1. One thing I want to mention is that this V1, even though this is the macula right here, this is this circle right here, this region, even though it's relatively very small according to the, compared to this entire visual field, but this one contains a lot of the receptor. So that's why we have highest acuity vision in this 
molecular area. And uh, that's why we focus everything here. And so this one has a very large compared to these other very large region to process the signal in the visual cortex. So the molecular, molecular signal are processed in the more that close to the peripheral portion of the V1, then dip into this circles, it processed 20, 20 degree region, 60 degree region, and 98 degree region in the end. So that's that. So this is the visual field. All right. And we have both eyes. So we have both eyes, and with these two eyes, visual fields are overlapped. I can show you this one here very easier. So this is the visual field of one eye, and this is the visual field of the other eye. So you can see that there is a big portion that is the overlap that be viewed by one eye as well as by the other eye. Why there is a gap here? That's because this region is the blind spot, about 15 degree, this blind spot. So you see this one here and this one here, but not here. Okay, so that's the blind spot. But this blind spot, you probably won't notice because this blind spot is covered by the other eye. So binocular, this region is covered. All right, so that's that. So you, your visual field from both eye would have this central portion is conducted by both eyes. So this is called the binocular zone. Two eyes both provide the vision. And we also have in the peripheral region will be the monocular crescent or monocular zone. Okay, this region will be only one eye see it, not both eye. So this is a visual field, and so visual field will be uh, in the center is like a, a macular area project into the macula is about only 18 or like 20 degree range. Very small, but provide very high acuity in the peripheral. And so this is the overall the human visual field is about left to right is about 60 to about 120. 107 degree. You don't need to memorize the number. I'm not going to quiz you on the number. Uh, you just get a sense that this is the typical like visual field that we have the range to see okay in that uh, lateral 60 degree left and the right, uh, maybe about uh, further down to a little bit like 107 or something right here. And that's what we see. And uh, up, it will be uh, 70 degree down to the 80 degree. So that's the visual field. Uh, you just need to know that visual field is, is quantified as a degree. It's not like meter, millimeter, centimeter, or inch or something like that. It's by the degree, okay? All right, so you have this visual field. Now, this visual field, this is a visual field will project into the retina. The way it project is like this one here. So this is the visual field. Say this is visual field. The way it project it, it will be project to the retina a way that things will become upside down, left side one, right, right side left. So that is the projection into the retina. So things will become up uh, uh, you know, the inversed, uh, but it will preserve this orderly uh, uh, coordination. So this is called the retinal optic, retinotopic, retinop, retinotopic. Uh, it's a topical, you know, mapping into the retina. And so this one showing you that this is uh, mapping uh, central portion. monocular visual field. So that's that. All right, so we have it. So how does it project further down? So here is the visual field. Uh, this is the left eye, right eye. There's overlap. So we mentioned about this one already. And uh, uh, one thing I want to say is that um, even though this visual field 
uh, uh, is this field. However, this field is not equally, does not present equal acuity. So uh, because this project into the retina and only those project into the macula has the best acuity. The, the peripheral region you will still see, but you don't see it as clear as the center. That's why when we see things, we like to put them in the front of us so we can see better on it. So this one showing you the visual field. Say so this is visual field. This is the macula right here. This is the, the, the macula. This is phobia. So this macula, you will have the visual acuity 2020. This one is the optic nerve head right here, optic nerve head. So this is a prime spot. And uh, so the acuity is best in the macula. However, this visual field acuity will become lower in the peripheral part. I'll just give you an idea that the acuity of this visual field is not equal across. Only in the center is the best. The peripheral, you can see it. You can sense it, but you cannot see it as clear as the center. Uh, and uh, this one is that I just want to show you that when we see things, we will put our put both eye uh, vision at the same point. This is called the fixation point. So this fixation point will, will have the light project into the fovea. That is the center of the center. This is the uh, the clear uh, projection into the retina, provide the best image. So that's the, that just want to show, use this one to show you, this is the fixation point that project into the same point will project into the fovea of both eyes. So that's how we uh, version that's the, this movement, this movement. This movement, virgin's movement. That's our eyes will put the same focus to the same spot. Put the focus to the same spot. Yeah, virgin's movement. So that's that. And then uh, we need to know about how is that project? How is this project? The way it project is like this one. So it, this may seem complicated, but I will make it very simple to understand, to memorize. So don't, don't need to worry about it. Basically these projects go through two pathway. One is from the retina to lateral geniculate nucleus, LGN. And then from the LGN to the striate cortex or the V1. So two pathway. So it could be retinal, geniculate pathway, and geniculate, geniculostride pathway. So two pathway. All right. So now first thing first, it will be very easy. So basically that in our visual field, the top portion, the superior visual land, visual field will project to the inferior retina. And the inferior visual field will project to the superior retina. So everything is upside down, left to right, right to left, into the retina. After that, everything will be the same. So the superior retina will project to the superior LGN, project to the superior visual cortex. The Inferior retina will project to the inferior LGN and the project to the inferior visual cortex. So that's easy, right? So the only difference, only in only upside down is in the beginning, the remaining will be the same. So very easy. All right. One thing I want to get your attention is this one, but we mentioned about this one already. So this is the projection from the macula. So this is the small region in the retina, in the retina. And this region, when they project into the visual cortex, they take a lot of the space. So this center 10 degree visual field uh, project into the macula uh, occupy a large portion in the visual, visual cortex. 
So, so that's something. So it's very uh, consistent across the cerebral cortex that, especially the sensory cortex that when there is the, the, the area occupied in the brain uh, is proportional to the number of the receptor in the peripheral. So when there is more receptor down here, there will be larger area occupied in the, in the cortex. So that's the only thing. So that's it. All right, what else we need to know? So it's just this one here showing you that uh, the, uh, the projection from the visual field to the visual cortex and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the macula is project down here. So we know that already more peripheral portion, the more peripheral is project into the deeper region of this sulcus. So this is called the visual, visual up, visual topic. This topical projection organization to the striate cortex. So what else we need to know? All right, so here in the visual cortex, let's talk about this visual cortex. This visual cortex, just very much like other cerebral cortex, uh, has six cellular layer. And uh, 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 so, so six layer, all right? So what do you need to know? So what you need to know is that only thing you need to know, uh, it will be in a quiz question, okay? So the only thing you need to know is that the input signal, the input signal go into the layer four. All right, that's it. There you go. Well, I will have a quiz question like the input signal, what's the input signal from the LGN, right? From the lateral geniculate nucleus into the visual cortex and, uh, and where they innervate it to innervated into the day year four. So I will have the option one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, which one is the layer that the signal go into is the day year four. It's the same thing in the somatic sensory cortex. So it's not like anything new here. All right, so that's that. And then they will project upside down, etc. So that's that. All right, uh, another, another region that we will talk about is that uh, we have two eyes, right? So it's very important that we will use the both eye information because uh, monocular information, just one eye, uh, even though it's good, you know, you can see things, you have good like a visual field, everything is okay, but you link, you, you don't have the information about the depth. So, so you, you, you put two, two, to object, right? You want to like, like let them touch each other. You have two pens. You want them to touch each other. If you only have one eye open, it will be very difficult to make these two like pin to touch each other. You need two, two eyes because you need that binocular information to, to get the idea about the depth of this object. All right, so, so we basically is a transition, this pathway from the retina to the visual cortex, to the visual associated cortex. It's a transition to gradually use this information from each eye to become the mixed information of both eyes. So, so that's the transition from the monocular information to the binocular information. So that's that. So very, very quickly that from here. So we already know that the eye project right here. So we're talking about like, like this one here. Eye project. So he this is monocular, right? Single, single project. But from here, after this cousin, this LGN, these lateral geniculate nucleus will carry information from one eye and the other. So here we'll have the information of both eyes. However, in the LGN, even though we have the information from both eyes, 
these information are distinct. They are in the same nucleus, but they are distinct. They are separated. So this green, blue represent green is the ipsilateral, means that it's the same side. This is the eye. This is the retina from the same side. Contralateral is from the opposite side. Contra, opposite side. So we have the green, the same side, retina project into the same side of the LGN. We also have the retina from the opposite side to the LGN. So we have the green, blue, green, green, blue, green, blue. All right. So these are individually monocular information. So even though we have both, but they are not mixed yet. So we still preserve very well monocular information from retinal ganglion cells to the LGN, and then this LGN will project to the visual cortex. They project to the layer form. So in the layer form, this still preserve as the, as the monocular information. However, after layer four, it will, things will become innervated to the uh, opposite uh, 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 if, uh, retina signal or ocular signal. And then we will gradually gather both uh, the information from both eyes. So we will gradually get the binocular information process. So, so this monocular to binocular information transition from the RGC to LGN to layer four, all this from the I to the this layer four of the B1 remain a monocular information. And from V layer four of the V1 to other layer and the associated visual cortex, this one process the binocular information. And binocular information is very important to process the depth of a signal, get the idea about the three-dimensional information relationship of the visual space. What is the associated visual cortex? Uh, that is called the uh, extra stride cortex right here. So this is the V1, V1 right here, and uh, uh, up to the layer four of the V1 is all only, even though it's only each neuron only received the monocular information. However, after that, it will be this, this neuron will gather information, not just a single mo mo monocular uh, information, it will, it will have the binocular information. And this binocular information is important uh, to provide the basis of the stereo, stereo cyst. So this is the uh, the sensation of the depth that we can see the world as a 3D world. So that's that. All right, so, so we now know that we have this projection in the, in the brain. We also have the 3D information, the depth of the information. Now, what's the next one? The next one is that, so we can do everything, right? We can have, we have this projection, so we kind of know uh, everything okay we have this projection and uh, and uh, everything seems to be like this one we have this projection everything's from the eye into the cortex so everything seems okay now so there are further study looking to it so for example that we can have a uh, uh, to exam say we can have the volunteer right and then look into a screen and provide different pattern of the vision and then we can have a camera to detect the eye, eye tracking, right? Camera to de detect the eye, to make sure that eye is not moving. And uh, to see, we detect the EEG, to detect the uh, visual cortical signal. And to see how is that visual pattern affects the visual cortex. This was originally, the idea was originally done not on human, but on the animal. So this is what, what, what the earlier study was done. So they put a projector on the screen, 
put a little cat here and put the electro here. What they found is very surprising, which is that this, this screen, when they put an object here, they can get a signal in the cortex. However, if they put a bar on the screen and they put a bar with different orientation, with different orientation, they, they, they found that they get the strongest signal in the cortex if the bar is located in a certain orientation. Say they put, they detect this, this region using the electro, detect this region and they put on the screen different orientation of the bar. And they found the strongest signal here if they present with this orientation. And then they shift it to a near cortical region and they provide the same experiment again. And they found that they detect a, the strongest signal with another orientation. So they, they realize that, that something like this one, in the end, we detect something like this one. So this is different column, different region in the cortex. And each one shows strongest signal, cortical signal, when the visual field is present with a certain type of the bar orientation. So this gives an give give this uh, give us an idea that when we see things, when we see things, we actually different cortical area, different cortical column is responsible, will be activated when we see certain type of the orientation. And, uh, and uh, this gives an idea that when we see things, we not just see things, we are very attention, pay our attention on something which is the contrast. So different orientation basically will have different age contrast. This is this one, this will be this angle, this will be this angle, this will be this angle, different angle. We are particularly sensitive to the contrast of a vision of the of the visual the visual uh, uh, in the visual field, so that's that. And that, that leads us another question: Why are we sensitive to the contrast? And that that will lead us to a, a further understanding of. So this is the one that we we didn't didn't mention that if we put the electro through it. Uh, if it's the same current, we will see that visual field is very much the same, a little bit like blurred, open, uh, enlarged in different region, but very much the same. If we put the orientation, it's very much the same. If we put the electro sideways through different current, A, B, C, D, A current, B current, C current, D current, E current, then we see that the visual field will be Different, of course, this is different projection. We also found that they are particularly sensitive to different bar orientation. So that's that's quite interesting. And uh, it gives us the idea that we are very sensitive to this age orientation. And why is that? And uh, so um, it turns out that our retina ganglia cells uh, even though in the beginning we say that 1% uh, is the uh, melanopsin, uh, radiant ganglion cells, 99% uh, get the signal from the photoreceptor. However, these 99% ganglion cells are not all the same. Uh, there are three major type of these retina ganglion cells, uh, M-type, P-type, and the K-type. The very major one are this M type and the P type. K type is a recently observed one. So, so this M type, P type, three K type. So what are these three type of the retinal ganglion cells? These ganglion cells, M type, are predominantly located in the peripheral retina. So they get the signal from the 
rods, not the cones. So they are not sensitive to the color. They are sensitive to the photon. And, uh, and they are also sensitive to the motion. So peripheral vision are detected by the rods project into the M-type retina ganglion cells. These cells are particularly sensitive to the motion. So when you try to move, if you are in the peripheral vision, you will be very quickly pick up. And we are very good at when we see things in the in the peripheral vision. If it's stationary, we probably won't won't even pay attention on it. But when it moves, we will be very sensitive to it. That's because of the M cell. They are sensitive to the motion. Little in color perception because the photoreceptors are rods, not cones. Uh, that's M type. P type are located in more like central retina. They receive signal from the cones, so they are sensitive to the color. And that they, uh, they, okay, so that's that. And these two, uh, what, what's, what else are they different is this one here. They have different adaptation. Surprise, not at all, right? Because when we learn about this somatic sensory system, we learned that in the same region, we typically has two type of the receptor there. We have one adapt fast. They are the one adapt slow. So same thing in the retina, we will have in the retina, we have a group of, of the RGC retina ganglion cells adapt fast. And uh, that is the M type. M type is say we give the stimulus, we give the same stimulus, the M type will adapt very fast. And that's why it's sensitive to the motion. Say if you are moving, you will see it, but, but over time, you, you, you don't respond to it. Right, so 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 that's the M type. They are, they are the neuron. They adapt fast, and uh, uh, they are, they 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 uh, they are sensitive to the motion. Uh, in contrast, P type are sensitive to the color, and uh, they are they adapt slow. So they are more like tonical tonically. Uh, 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 responsive to the stationary or continuous stimulus. So we can uh, perceive the color and uh, uh, in the, in, by this P-type neuron. So that's that. So we have these two types of the ganglion cells. One adapt fast, the other one adapt slow. M-type adapt fast, P-type adapt slow. They then project into the LGN, this retina ganglion cell then project into the LGN. In the LGN, lateral genetic nucleus has six layers. The ventral two layers are called magnocellular layer. These two receive signal from the M type. So, so that's great, that's right here. M type to the magnocellular layer in the LGN. P type project into the parvocellular layer of the LGN. So P to P, M to M. So that's very easy to understand. So that's this one. So uh, retina ganglia cell project into the LGN. They project into different nomina, different layer. Uh, project into the M project into the magnocellular layer, the ventral two layer. Uh, P retina ganglia cell P type project into the parvocellular layer of the LGN, and the K project into this kinocellular in the in inner. But this is rarely the newly observed one. So project down here in the kino uh, kinocellular layer. So that's that's right here. Okay, kinocell K project into kinocellular layer. So that's that. And then from here, they will project into the visual cortex, right? So this is the LGN project into the visual cortex. When they project into the visual cortex, visual cortex six layer, as we talked before, 
the input signal is input into the layer four. So majority of those M and P are projected into layer four. The magnocellular uh, located in the two ventral layer of the LGN, they are receive the M type ganglion cell, high temporal resolution, so sensitive to the motion project to the 4C alpha right here in the V1, in the ventral cord, uh, in the visual cortex. The powerful cellular layer uh, receives signal from the P ganglion cell, sensitive to the color, good at spatial resolution, right? Because they are in the center, very good acuity. They project into the powerful cellular project into the 4C beta in the V1. We also have the K type project in the kino cellular. They are located in the interlaminar zone that separate larger, uh, later, uh, genetic, later nuclear layer and receive K ganglion cells. They project in a patchy fashion in the uh, layer two and the three. So, so that's, that's how these three type of the RGC project into the LGN, nitrogenic nucleus, then project into the V1. All right, and then uh, 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 we talked about this one already. This column in the visual cortex, each column uh, is uh, uh, sensitive or provide the strongest response to a particular orientation of the of this uh, of this bar, and uh, so we we call this uh, orientation columns in the cortical neurons, uh, and uh, this 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 orientation is called the preferred orientation in each column. And we, we see that this orientation gradually change in the neighboring columns. So we can see it gradually change. And so it can change back to the same orientation. So a group of these uh, from the beginning to the end is called, this group is called the hypercolumn. This column is called the hypercolumn. They cover the orientation change from zero degree to another zero degree, something like that. And then we still show this one, one already. We can also do a color representation that different orientation and using different colors. So you can see that these regions, say this, this region, different column, different cortical column are sensitive to different orientation, right? So with this transition, say orange, yellow, green, orange, yellow, green, blue, blue, purple, then red. So this transition shown as continuous like change in the cortex. So it's just color representation showing you that in the visual cortex, different color is sensitive to different bar orientation. And in addition to that, so this is one region and the neighboring will have the same one, but from the, the opposite side of the eye. So that's that. So this is the uh, ocular dominance uh, current, like left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye. All right. This is also very important. The one concept is that this uh, preferred orientation structure in the cortex is developed after birth. So, um, so if so, that's very important. That when when infant uh, is delivered, their cortical region is not fully function yet because they never receive the light, they never see a thing in mother's fetus, right? In the in, in mother's body. So so their visual cortical region is not fully developed yet. And that is a very important period of time that you need to provide the infant 
with good visual stimulation. And uh, uh, if the uh, infant doesn't have that proper visual stimulation in both eyes, they will not develop, develop proper uh, development in this uh, cortical uh, circuit structure in the visual cortex. And uh, uh, once you miss that window, this will be set and, uh, and uh, it will be, it will not be able to uh, uh, establish afterwards. So that's that. Now in the very last two, three slides, I want to talk about another, not another, the extension from the V1. There is the, in addition to the V1 is the striate cortex. We also have the associated cortex. All right, so this is the extra striate cortex, including several regions, V2, V3, V4, VP, ventral posterior area, MT, middle temporal area, and MSD, medial superior temporal area. So, so one thing that this may seem to be very kind of like diverse, not organized, but one thing that you need to know is that there is two major pathway in this extra stride cortex. So that's the very last one. You need to know this one and that's it, okay? So this is that, this visual system, when they project into V1, we need to make sense of it. We need to try to understand it. The way to understand it is to project into the extra stride cortex. There are two extra stride cortical process. One is called the ventral string. Ventral string go from V1 to V2 to V4. This process project into the temporal lobe. This process is important for object recognition. So you know that in temporal lobe, we have uh, the uh, hippo hippocampus, that's process, that's the region to, uh, to, to, to conduct the memory. So we basically get the vision sent to V4 and uh, this vision will need to be recognized. We want to understand the world. So we will kind of search that what we saw before was in the memory what's the experience with this region. And we kind of try to make sense of it. So that's this V4 pathway, this ventral stream pathway. Another pathway is the V1 to V2 to MT, the middle temporal area. This one is the one to analyze the movement. So this is more like temporal. This one is not just the 3D world, not just 2D and the depth, this one is like 4D because now we bring the speed to it, bring the time with it. So this one will analyze the vision and also analyze the frames of the vision. So it's like a movie, we see it and we try to understand these movements and to understand different movements with someone, something is not moving and something is moving and try to understand this motion or position relationship. So this is the uh, dorsal stream. So that's, that's two major streams. And uh, in the end of the day, that's the way we see things. Uh, it, it can be also viewed as that is we try to interpret what we saw. So we, 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 we basically see things and then we, we try to make sense of it. And this is very important process because then we will be able to get relate, to, to get the, get be, have be related to the thing we saw. And that's a very important process that to understand what we, we are seeing. And this, this, um, uh, this, this play an important role that each individual, because we, we try to interpret the, interpret the object that we see, it will involve some kind of 
personal, some kind of like a, a individual say bias, right? Because when you see things, you try to interpret it. And uh, just very something that I, I thought about just recently is that say we have the iPhone, right? iPhone 12 just out. And uh, you, you probably know that there are so many different colors. Why do you like this color? Why this color present to you go through V1 and go through V4 and you recognize it, you like it. And someone like blue, someone like green, right? What makes you like this color? What, what's your interpretation of this object? What's good, what's bad, what's beautiful, what's ugly, right? So this interpretation always built in our brain. And that's how we see things. We, we very quickly interpret or in the same way we judge, right? We judge the thing we saw. And this, this carries some bias with it. And this is process here. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, it may be related to the history, related to your memory, or related to a lot of things, right? So that's, that's the importance of this extra stride cortical process. So that's that. And, uh, and, uh, um, and as for the, uh, in the end, I want to uh, use this, these two YouTube um, video to, to, you know, if you have time, like during your lunch time or something, you can, you can kind of use this to entertain yourself a little bit. That this is, uh, people can recognize faces, but you must know that some people are very good at recognize faces, very good. And in contrast, in, 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 in another extremes, some people are very bad at recognizing faces. So this is called uh, facial blindness. And uh, uh, this is called visual agnosia. And, uh, uh, and this is something very important that some people just cannot memorize, recognize faces. And uh, this is also related to this. Is visual is not problem, you can see, but the problem is to interpret, to interpret, that is a problem. And sometimes that's something, and this is also something that uh, we talked about earlier uh, with one of my colleagues is that uh, the art, right? When you see a view, you draw it. You can draw it very realistic. It will be probably really on your V1 because you have good visual topical. Everybody has good visual topical, but it's just how you interpret it. If you interpret it very solely based on your V1, you probably can draw things very realistically. But you know that we can have artists that can draw things like Picasso, right? It can draw that beautiful woman to another very obstructive painting. Why is that? Because that's how he interpreted. It goes through this extra stride cortex to interpret it like that. And sometimes we resonate with it. And that's how we feel this is good painting. We resonate with it. All right, so that's that, all right? A lot of like, a, you know, science, but also related to psychology in a way. That's the neuroscience. You know, neuroscience is, is not just the science, but related to our emotion or understanding or like a, a, a consciousness. Yeah. All right, so that's that. And uh, that ends the sensor, sensory nervous system. And uh, then I'm going to prepare the motor system. And, uh, and uh, uh, let me know if you have any question. All right.